Chapter One of The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, Book Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, Book Six, by Diogenes Laetius, translated by Charles Duke Young. Chapter One life of antisthenes antisthenes was an athenian the son of antisthenes and he was said not to be a legitimate athenian in reference to which he said to someone who was reproaching him with the circumstance the mother of the gods too is a phrygian for he was thought to have had a thracian mother on which account as he had borne himself bravely in the battle of tanagra he gave occasion to socrates to say that the son of two Athenians could not have been so brave, and he himself, when disparaging the Athenians who gave themselves great airs as having been born out of the earth itself, said that they are not more noble, as far as that went, than snails and locusts. Originally he was the pupil of Gorgias, the rhetorician, owing to which he employs rhetorical style of language in his dialogues, especially in his truth and in his exhortations. And Hermippus says that he had originally intended in his address at the assembly, on the account of Esthymian games, to attack and also to praise the Athenians and the Thebans and Lacedaemonians, but that he afterwards abandoned the design when he saw that there were a great many spectators come from those cities. Afterwards, he attached himself to Socrates and made such progress in philosophy while with him that he advised all his own pupils to become his fellow pupils in the school of Socrates. And as he lived in the Piraeus, he went up forty furlongs to the city every day in order to hear Socrates, from whom he learned the art of enduring and of being indifferent to external circumstances, and so become the original founder of the Cynic school and he used to argue that labour was a good thing by adducing the examples of the great hercules and the kairos one of which he derived from the greeks and the other from the barbarians he was also the first person who ever gave the definition of a discourse saying discourse is that which shows what anything is or was and he used continually to say i would rather go mad than feel pleasure and one ought to attach oneself to such women as will thank one for it he said once to a youth from pontus who was on the point of coming to him to be his pupil and was asking him what he wanted you want a new book and a new pen and a new tablet meaning a new mind and to a person who asked him from what country he had better marry a wife he said if you marry a handsome woman she will be a common footnote there is a play on the similarity of the words koini common and poini punishment end of footnote if an ugly woman she will be a punishment to you he was told once that plato spoke ill of him and he replied it is a royal privilege to do well and to be ill spoken of when he was being initiated into the mysteries of Orpheus, and the priest said that those who were initiated enjoy many good things in the shades below, Why then, said he, do not you die? Being once reproached as not being the son of two free citizens, he said, And I am not the son of two people skilled in wrestling. Nevertheless, I am a skilful wrestler. On one occasion he was asked, why he had but few disciples and said because they drove them away with a silver rod when he was asked why he reproved his peoples with bitter language he said physicians too use severe remedies for their patients once he saw an adulterer running away and said o oh, unhappy man how much danger could you have avoided for one obol he used to say as hecaton tells us in his apothegms that it was better to fall among the crows. Footnote. The Greek is Eschorakas. 
which was a proverb for utter destruction. End of footnote. Then among flatterers, for that they only devour the dead, but the others devour the living. When he was asked what was the most happy event that could take place in a human life, he said, to die while prosperous. On one occasion, one of his friends was lamenting to him that he had lost his memoranda, and he said to him, You ought to have written them on your mind, and not on paper. A favourite saying of his was, that envious people were devoured by their own disposition, just as iron is by rust. Another was, that those who wish to be immortal ought to live piously and justly. He used to say too, that cities were ruined when they were unable to distinguish worthless citizens from virtuous ones. On one occasion, he was being praised by some wicked men and said, I am sadly afraid that I must have done some wicked thing. One of his favorite sayings was, that the fellowship of brothers of one mind was stronger than any fortified city. He used to say that those things were best for a man to take on a journey which would float with them if he were shipwrecked. He was once reproached for being intimate with wicked men and said, Physicians also live with those who are sick and yet they do not catch fevers. He used to say, that it was an absurd thing to clean a cornfield of tars, and in war to get rid of bad soldiers, and yet not to rid oneself in a city of wicked citizens. When he was asked what advantage he had ever derived from philosophy, he replied, the advantage of being able to converse with myself. At a drinking party, a man once said to him, Give us a song, and he replied, do you play us a tune on the flute? When Diogenes asked him for a tunic, he bade him fold his cloak. He was asked on one occasion, what learning was the most necessary, and he replied, to unlearn one's bad habits. And he used to exhort those who found themselves ill-spoken of to endure it more than they would anyone's throwing stones at them. He used to laugh at Plato as concited. Accordingly, once when there was a fine procession, seeing a horse neighing, he said to Plato, I think you too would be a very frisky horse. And he said this all the more, because Plato kept continually praising the horse. At another time, he had gone to see him when he was ill. And when he saw there a dish in which Plato had been sick, he said, I see your bile there, but I do not see your consight. He used to advise the Athenians to pass a ode, that asses were horses, and, as they thought that irrational, he said, Why, those whom you make generals have never learned to be real generals, they have only been voted such. A man once said to him one day, Many people praise you. Why, what evil, said he, have I done? When he turned the rent in his cloak outside, Socrates seeing it, said to him, I see your vanity through the hole in your cloak. On another occasion, the question was put to him by someone. As Phanias relates in his treatise on the philosophers of the Socratic school, what a man could do to show himself an honorable and a virtuous man? And he replied, If you attend to those who understand the subject and learn from them that you ought to shun the bad habits you have. Someone was praising luxury in his hearing, and he said, May the children of my enemies be luxurious. Seeing a young man place himself in a carefully studied attitude before a modeler, he said, Tell me, if the brass could speak, on what would it pride itself? And when the young man replied, On its beauty, Are you not then, said he, ashamed to rejoice in the same thing as an inanimate piece of brass? A young man from Pontus once promised to recollect him if a vessel of salt fish arrived, and so he took with him and also an empty bag and went to a woman who sold meal, and filled a sack and went away. And when the woman asked him to pay for it, he said, The young man will pay you when the vessel of salt fish comes home.
he it was who appears to have been the cause of antius's banishment and of meletus's death for having met with some men of pontus who had come to athens on the account of the reputation of socrates he took them to anytus telling them that in moral philosophy he was wiser than socrates and they who stood by were indignant at this and drove him away and whenever he saw a woman beautifully adorned he would go off to her house and desire her husband to bring forth his horse and his arms and then if he had such things he would give him leave to indulge in luxury for that he had the means of defending himself but if he had them not then he would bid him to strip his wife of her ornaments and the doctrines he adopted were these he used to insist that virtue was a thing which might be taught also that a nobly born and virtuously disposed by the same people for that virtue was of itself sufficient for happiness and was in need of nothing except the strength of socrates he also looked upon virtue as a species of work not wanting many arguments or much instruction and he thought that the wise man was insufficient for himself for that everything that belonged to any one else belonged to him he considered obscurity of fame a good thing and equally good with labour and he used to say that the wise man would regulate his conduct as a citizen not according to established laws of the state but according to the laws of virtue and that he would marry for the sake of having children selecting the most beautiful woman for his wife and that he would love her for that the wise man alone knew what objects deserved love diocles also attributes the following apothegms to him to the wise man nothing is strange and nothing remote the virtuous man is worthy to be loved good men are friends it is right to make the brave and just one's allies virtue is a weapon of which a man cannot be deprived it is better to fight with a few good men against all the wicked than with many wicked men against a few good men one should attend to one's enemies for that they are the first person to detect one's errors one should consider a just man as of more value than a relation virtue is the same in a man as in a woman what is good is honorable and what is bad is disgraceful think everything that is wicked foreign prudence is the safest fortification for it can neither fall to pieces nor be betrayed one must prepare oneself a fortress in one's own impregnable thoughts he used to lecture in the gymnasium called sinosarges not far from the gates and some people say that it is from that place that the sect got the name cynics and he himself was called haplosion downright dog he was the first person to set the fashion of doubling his cloak as diocles says and he wore no other garment and he used to carry a stick and a wallet but nianthus says that he was the first person who wore a cloak without folding it but sosicrates in the third book of his successions says that diodorus of aspendos let his beard grow and used to carry a stick and a wallet he is the only one of all the pupils of socrates whom theopompus praises and speaks of as clever and able to persuade whomsoever he pleased by the sweetness of his conversation and this is plain both from his own writings and from the banquet of xenophon he appears to have been the founder of more manly stoic school on which account athenius the epigrammist speaks thus of them o e a who learned are in the stoic fables e a who consigned the wisest of all doctrines to your most sacred books you say that virtue is the sole good for that alone can save the life of a man and the strongly fenced cities but if some fancy pleasure their best aim one of the muses does who has convinced them he was the original cause of the apathy of diogenes and the temperance of cratus and the patience of zeno having himself as it were laid the foundations of the city which they afterwards built and xenophon says that in his conversation and society he was the most delightful of men and in every respect the most temperate 
there are ten volumes of his writings extant the first volume is that in which there is an essay on style or on the figures of speech the ajax or speech of ajax the defence of orestes or the treatise on lawyers the isograph or the lysias and isocrates the reply to the work of isocrates entitled the absence of witnesses the second volume is that in which we have the treatise on the nature of animals on the procreation of children or on marriage an essay on armatory character on the sophists an essay on physiognomical character on justice and manly virtue being three essays on hereditary character two treatises on theogenes the third volume contains a treatise on the good on manly courage on law or political constitutions on law or what is honorable and just on freedom and slavery on good faith on a guardian or on a persuasion on victory an economical essay the fourth volume contains the kairos the greater hercules or a treatise on strength the fifth volume contains the kairos or the treatise on kingly power the aspasia the sixth volume is that in which there is a treatise on truth another a disputatious one concerning arguing the saton or on contradiction in three parts and an essay on dialect the seventh contains a treatise on education or names in five books one on the use of names or contentious man one on questions and answers one on opinion and knowledge in four books one on dying one on life and death one on those who were in the shades below one on nature in two books two books of questions in natural philosophy one essay opinions on the contentious man one book of problems on the subject of learning the eighth volume is that in which we find a treatise on music one on interpreters one on homer one on injustice and impiety one on cultures one on a spy one on pleasure the ninth book contains an essay on the odyssey one on the magic wand the minerva or an essay on the telemachus an essay on helen and penelope one on proteus the cyclops being an essay on elysus an essay on the use of wine or on drunkenness or on the cyclops one on kirche one on amphiaraus one on ulysses and penelope and also on ulysses's dog the tenth volume is occupied by the hercules or medas the hercules or an essay on the prudence or strength the lord or the lover the lord or the spies the menexenus or an essay on governing the alcibiades the archelaus or an essay on kingly power these then are the names of his works and timon rebuking him because of their great number called him a universal chatterer he died of some disease and while he was ill diogenes came to visit him and said to him have you no need of a friend once too he came to see him with a sword in his hand and when antisthenes said who can deliver me from this suffering he pointed to the sword and said this can but he rejoined i said suffering not from life for he seemed to bear his disease the more calmly from his love of life and there is an epigram on him written by ourselves which runs thus in your life you were a bitter dog antisthenes born to bite people's minds with saying sharp not with your actual teeth now you are slain by fell consumption passers by may say why should he not one wants a guide to hell there were also three other people of the same name of antisthenes one a disciple of heraclitus the second an ephesian the third a historian of roads and since we have spoken of those who proceeded from the school of aristippus and phaedon we may now go on to the cynics and stoics who derived their origin from antisthenes and we will take them in the following order end of chapter 1
read by lambda chapter 2 part 1 of the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book 6 by diogenes laertius translated by charles duke young chapter 2 part 1 life of diogenes diogenes was a native of sinope the son of Thracius, a money changer and diocles says that he was forced to flee from his native city as his father kept the public bank there and had adulterated the coinage but ebulides in his essay on diogenes says that it was diogenes himself who did this and that he was banished with his father and indeed he himself in his peridalus says of himself that he had adulterated the public money others say that he was one of the curators and was persuaded by the artisans employed and that he went to delphi or else to the oracle of delos and there consulted apollo as to whether he should do what people were trying to persuade him to do and that as the god gave him permission to do so diogenes not comprehending that the god meant that he might change the political customs footnote the passage is not free from difficulty but the thing which misled diogenes appears to have been that nomisma the word here used meant both a coin or coinage and a custom end of footnote of his country if he could adulterated the coinage and being detected was banished as some people say but as other accounts have it took the alarm and fled away of his own accord some again say that he adulterated the money which he had received from his father and that his father was thrown into prison and died there but that diogenes escaped and went to delphi and asked not whether he might tamper with the coinage but what he could do to become very celebrated and that in consequence he received the oracular answer which i have mentioned and when he came to athens he attached himself to antisthenes but as he repelled him because he admitted no one he at last forced his way into him by his pertinacity and once when he raised his stick at him he put his head under it and said strike for you will not find any stick hard enough to drive me away as long as you continue to speak and from this time forth he was one of his pupils and being an exile he naturally betook himself to a simple mode of life and when as theophrastus tells us in his megaric philosopher he saw a mouse running about and not seeking for a bed nor taking care to keep in the dark nor looking for any of those things which appear enjoyable to such an animal he found a remedy for his own poverty he was according to the account of some people the first person who doubled up his cloak out of necessity and who slept in it and who carried a wallet in which he kept his food and who used whatever place was near for all sorts of purposes eating and sleeping and conversing in it in reference to which habit he used to say pointing to the colonnade of jupiter and to the public magazine that the athenians had built him places to live in being attacked with illness he supported himself with a staff and after that he carried it continually not indeed in the city but whenever he was walking in the roads together with his wallet as olympiodorus the chief man of the athenians tells us and polymeter the orator and Desanias, the son of escorion tell the same story when he had written to someone to look out and get ready a small house for him as he delayed to do it he took a cask 
which he found in the temple of Sibyl for his house, as he himself tells us in his letters. And during the summer he used to roll himself in the warm sand, but in winter he would embrace statues, all covered with snow, practising himself on every occasion to endure anything. He was very violent in expressing his haughty disdain for others. He said that the scholy school of Euclidus was scholy gal, and he used to call Plato's diatrivi discussions catatrivi disguise. It was also a saying of his that Dionysian games were a great marvel to fools, and the demagogues were the ministers of the multitude. He used likewise to say that when in the course of his life he beguiled pilots and physicians and philosophers, he thought man was the wisest of all animals. But when again he beheld interpreters of dreams and soothsayers and those who listened to them, and men puffed up with glory or riches, then he thought that there was not more foolish animal than man. Another of his saying was that he thought a man ought oftener to provide himself with a reason than with a halter. On one occasion, when he noticed Plato at a very costly entertainment tasting some olives, he said, O oh, you wise man, why, after having sailed to Sicily for the sake of such a feast, do you not enjoy what you have before you? And Plato replied, By the gods, Diogenes, while I was there I ate olives, and all such good things a great deal. Diogenes rejoined, What then did you want to sail to Syracuse for? Did not Attica at the time produce any olives? But Favorinus, in his universal history, tells this story of Aristippus. At another time, he was eating dried figs when Plato met him, and he said to him, You may have a share of these. And as he took some and ate them, he said, I said that you might have a share of them, not that you might eat them all. On one occasion, Plato had invited some friends who had come to him from Dionysius to a banquet, and Diogenes trampled on his carpets and said, Thus, I trample on the empty pride of Plato, and Plato made him answer, How much arrogance are you displaying, O Diogenes, when you think that you are not arrogant at all? But as others tell the story, Diogenes said, Thus I trample on the pride of Plato, and that Plato rejoined, With quite as much pride as yourself, O Diogenes, Sorcian too, in his fourth book, states, that Cynic made the following speech to Plato. Diogenes once asked him for some wine and then for some dried figs. So he sent him an entire jar full. And Diogenes said to him, Will you, if you are asked how many two and two make, answer twenty? In this way, you neither give with any reference to what you are asked for, nor do you answer with reference to the question put to you. He used also to ridicule him as an interminable talker. When he was asked where in Greece he saw a virtuous man, Men, said he, nowhere, but I see good boys in Lacedaemon. On one occasion, when no one came to listen to him while he was discoursing seriously, he began to whistle, and then people flooded round him. He reproached them for coming with eagerness to folly, but being lazy and indifferent about good things. One of his frequent sayings was that men contended with one another in punching and kicking, but that no one showed any emulation in the pursuit of virtue. He used to express his astonishment at the grammarians for being desirous to learn everything about the misfortunes of Elias, and being ignorant of their own. He used also to say, that the musicians fitted the strings to the lyre properly, but left all the habits of their soul ill arranged, and that mathematicians kept their eyes fixed on the sun and moon and overlooked what was under their feet, that orators were anxious to speak justly, but not at all about acting so, also that misers blamed money, but were preposterously fond of it. 
he often condemned those who praised the just for being superior to money but who at the same time are eager themselves for great riches he was also very indignant at seeing men sacrificed to the gods to procure good health and ate at the sacrifice eating in a manner injurious to health he often expressed his surprise at slaves who seeing their masters eating in glutinous manner still did not themselves lay hand on any of the eatables he would frequently praise those who were about to marry and yet did not marry or who were about to take a voyage and yet did not take a voyage or who were about to engage in affairs of state and did not do so and those who were about to rear children yet did not rear any and those who were preparing to take up their abode with princes and yet did not take it up one of his sayings was that one ought to hold out one's hand to a friend without closing the fingers hermippus in his sale of diogenes says that he was taken a prisoner and put up to be sold and asked what he could do and he answered govern men and so he bade the crier give notice that if any one wants to purchase a master there is one here for him when he was ordered not to sit down it makes no difference said he for fish are sold be where they may he used to say that he wondered at men always ringing a dish or a jar before buying it but being content to judge a man by just his look alone when zeniades bought him he said to him that he ought to obey him even though he was a slave for the physician or a pilot would find men to obey them even though they might be slaves and eubulus says in his essay entitled the sale of diogenes that he taught the children of zeniades after their other lessons to ride and shoot and sling and dart and then in the gymnasium he did not permit the trainer to exercise them after the fashion of athletes but exercised them himself to just the degree sufficient to give them a good color and good health and the boys retained in their memory many sentences of poets and prose writers and of diogenes himself and he used to give them a concise statement of everything in order to strengthen their memory and at home he used to teach them to wait upon themselves contenting themselves with plain food and drinking water and he accustomed them to cut their hair close and to eschew ornament and to go without tunics or shoes and to keep silent looking at nothing except themselves as they walked along he used also to take them out hunting and they paid the greatest attention and respect to diogenes himself and spoke well of him to their parents and the same author affirms that he grew old in the household of zeniades and that when he died he was buried by his sons and that while he was living with them zeniades once asked him how he should bury him and he said on my face and when he was asked why he said because in a little while everything will be turned upside down and he said this because the macedonians were already attaining power and becoming a mighty people from having been very inconsiderable once when a man had conducted him into a magnificent house and told him that he must not spit after hawking a little he spit in his face saying that he could not find a worse place but some tell the story of aristippus once he called out hulaho men and when some people gathered round him in consequence he drove them away with his stick saying i call men and not dregs this anecdote i have derived from hecaton in the first book of apothegms they also relate that alexander said that if he had not been alexander he should have liked to be diogenes he used to call an apiroi cripples not those who were dumb or blind but those who had no wallet pira on one occasion he went half shaved into an entertainment of young men 
as metroclus tells us in his apothegms and was beaten by them and afterwards he wrote the names of all those who had beaten him on a white tablet and went about with the tablet round his neck so as to expose them to insult and as they were generally condemned and reproached for their conduct he used to see that he was the hound of those who were praised but that none of those who praised them dared to go out hunting with him a man once said to him i conquered men at the pythian games on which he said i conquer men but you only conquer slaves when some people said to him you are an old man and should rest for the remainder of your life why so replied he suppose i had to run a long distance or try to stop when i was near the end and not rather press on once when he was invited to a banquet he said that he would not come for that the day before no one had thanked him for coming he used to go barefoot through the snow and to do a number of other things which have been already mentioned once he attempted to eat raw meat but he could not digest it on one occasion he found demosthenes the orator dining in an inn and as he was slipping away he said to him you will now be ever so much more in an inn footnote this line is from eripides media 411 end of footnote once when some strangers wished to see demosthenes he stretched out his middle finger and said this is the great demagogue of athenian people when someone had dropped a loaf and was ashamed to pick it up again he wishing to give him a lesson tied a cord round the neck of a bottle and dragged it all through the ceramicus he used to say that he imitated the teachers of choruses for that they spoke too loud in order that the rest might catch up the proper tone another of his sayings was that most men were within the finger's breadth of being mad if then any one were to walk along stretching out his middle finger he will seem to be mad but if he puts his forefinger he will not be thought so another of his sayings was that the things of great value were often sold for nothing and vice versa accordingly that a statue would fetch 3000 drachmas and a bushel of meal only two obols when zeniades had bought him he said to him come do what you are ordered to and when he said the streams of sacred river now run backwards to their source suppose rejoined diogenes you had been sick and you had bought a physician could you refuse to be guided by him and tell him the streams of sacred rivers now run backwards to their source once a man came to him and wished to study philosophy as his pupil and he gave him a sapeda footnote the sapeda was a crocinus a kind of fish when salted end of footnote and made him follow him and as he from shame threw it away and departed he soon afterwards met him and laughing said to him a sapeda has dissolved your friendship for me but diocles tells this story in the following manner that when someone had said to him give me a commission diogenes he carried him off and gave him half a penny worth of cheese to carry and as he refused to carry it see said diogenes a half a penny worth of cheese has broken off our friendship on one occasion he saw a child drinking out of its hands and so he threw away the cup which belonged to his wallet saying that child has beaten me in simplicity he also threw away his spoon after seeing a boy when he had broken his vessel take up his lentils with a crust of bread and he used to argue thus everything belongs to the gods and wise men are the friends of the gods all things are in common among friends therefore everything belongs to the wise men once he saw a woman falling down before the gods in an unbecoming attitude he 
wishing to cure her of her superstitions as zolius of perga tells us came up to her and said are you not afraid o woman to be in such an indecent attitude when some god may be behind you for every place is full of him he consecrated a man to esculapius who was to run up and beat all those who prostrated themselves with their faces to the ground and as he was in the habit of saying that the tragic course had come upon him for that he was houseless and cityless a piteous exile from his dear native land a wandering beggar scrapping a pittance poor from day to day and another of his sayings was that he opposed confidence to fortune nature to law and reason to suffering once while he was sitting in the sun in the cranium alexander was standing by and said to him ask any favour you choose of me and he replied cease to shade me from the sun on one occasion a man was reading some long passages and when he came to the end of the book and showed that there was nothing more written be of good cheer my friends exclaimed diogenes i see land a man once proved to him syllogistically that he had horns so he put up his hand to his forehead and said i do not see them and in a similar manner he replied to one who had been asserting that there was no such thing as motion by getting up and walking away when a man was talking about the heavenly bodies and meteors pray how many days said he to him is it since you came down from the heaven a profligate enange had written on his house let no evil thing enter in where said diogenes is the master of the house going after having anointed his feet with perfume he said that the ointment from his head mounted up to heaven and that from his feet up to his nose when the athenians entreated him to be initiated in the eleusinian mysteries and said that in the shades below the initiated had the best seats it will he replied be an absurd thing if agesilaus and epomenondas are to live in the mud and some miserable wretches who have been initiated are to be in the islands of the blessed some mice crept up to his table and he said see even diogenes maintains his favourites once when he was leaving the bath and a man asked him whether many men were bathing he said no but when a number of people came out he confessed that there were great many when plato called him a dog he said undoubtedly for i have come back to those who sold me plato defined man thus man is a two-footed featherless animal and was much praised for the definition so diogenes plucked a cock and brought it into his school and said this is plato's man for which account this addition was made to the definition with broad flat nails a man once asked him what was the proper time for supper and he made answer if you are a rich man whenever you please and if you are a poor man whenever you can when he was at megara he saw some sheep carefully covered with skins and the children running about naked and so he said it is better at megara to be the man's ram than his son a man once struck him with a beam and then said take care what said he are you going to strike me again he used to say the demagogues were the servants of the people and garlands the blossoms of glory having lighted a candle in the daytime he said i am looking for a man on one occasion he stood under a fountain and as the bystanders were pitying him plato who was present said to them if you wish really to show your pity for him come away intimating that he was only acting thus out of a desire for notoriety once when a man had struck him with his fist he said o oh, hercules what a strange thing i should be walking about with a helmet on without knowing it 
when Maidia struck him with his fist and said, There are three thousand drachmas for you. The next day, Diogenes took the sisters of a boxer and beat him soundly and said, There are three thousand drachmas for you. Footnote. This is probably an allusion to a prosecution instituted by Demosthenes against Midias, but was afterwards compromised by Midias being Demosthenes, thirty minae, or three thousand drachmae. See Demosthenes, or Con Midias. End of footnote. When Lysias, the drug seller, asked him whether he thought there were any gods, how, said he, can I help thinking so, when I consider you to be hated by them? But some attribute this reply to Theodorus. Once he saw a man purifying himself by washing, and said to him, O oh, wretched man, do not you know, that as you cannot wash away blunders in the grammar by purification, so too you cannot more efface the errors of a life in the same manner. He used to say that men were wrong for complaining of fortune, for that they ask of the gods what appear to be good things, not what are really so. And to those who were alarmed at dreams, he said, that they did not regard what they do while they are awake, but being a great fuss, what they fancy they see while they are asleep. Once at the Olympic Games, when the herald proclaimed, Dioxippus is the conqueror of men, he said, he is the conqueror of slaves. I am the conqueror of men. End of chapter 2 Part 1 Read by Lambda Chapter 2 Part 2 Of The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers Book 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, Book 6, by Diogenes Laertius, translated by Charles Duke Young. Chapter 2, Part 2 Life of Diogenes He was greatly beloved by the Athenians. Accordingly, when a youth had broken his cask, they beat him and gave Diogenes another. And Dionysus, the Stoic, says that after the battle of Cronia, he was taken a prisoner and brought to Philip, and being asked who he was, replied, A spy, to spy upon your insatiability. And Philip marvelled at him and let him go. Once, when Alexander had sent a letter to Athens, to Antipater, by the hands of a man named Athelias, he, being present, said, Athelias from Athelius, by means of Athelias to Athelius. Footnote. This is a pun upon the similarity of Athelias's name to the Greek adjective Athelios, which signifies miserable. End of footnote. When Perdiccas threatened that he would put him to death if he did not come to him, he replied, That is nothing strange, for a scorpion or a tarantula could do as much. You had better threaten me that, if I kept away, you should be very happy. He used constantly to repeat with emphasis that an easy life had been given to man by the gods, but that it had been overlaid by their seeking for honey, cheesecakes, and anjuans, and things of that sort. On which account he said to a man who had his shoes put on by his servant, You are not thoroughly happy unless he also wipes your nose for you and he will do this if you are crippled in your hands. On one occasion, when he had seen the Hieronymonas, footnote, the Hieronymonas were sacred secretaries or recorders sent by Amphitionic state to the council along with their Pelagoras, the actual deputy or minister, end of footnote, leading off one of the stewards who had stolen a goblet, he said, the great thieves are carrying off the little thief, at another time, seeing a young man throwing stone at a cross, he said, Well done, you will be sure to reach the mark. Once too, 
some voice got round him and said we are taking care that you do not bite us but he said be of good cheer my boys a dog does not eat beef he saw a man giving himself airs because he was clad in a lion's skin and said to him do not go on disgracing the garb of nature when people were speaking of the happiness of calisthenes and saying that splendid treatment he received from alexander he replied the man then is wretched for he is forced to break fast and dine whenever alexander chooses when he was in want of money he said that he reclaimed it from his friends and did not beg for it on one occasion he was working with his hands in the market place and said i wish i could rub my stomach in the same way and so avoid hunger when he saw a young man going with some satraps to supper he dragged him away and led him off to his relations and bade them take care of him he was once addressed by a youth beautifully adorned who asked him some question and he refused to give him any answer till he satisfied him whether he was a man or a woman and on one occasion when a youth was playing the cotabus in the bath he said to him the better you do it the worse you do it once at a banquet some of the guests threw him bones as if he had been a dog so he as he went away put his leg against them as if he had been a dog in reality he used to call the orators and all those who speak for fame thrisanthropy thrice men instead of thrisathlio thrice miserable he said that rich but ignorant men was like a sheep with a golden fleece when he saw a notice on the house of a profligate man to be sold i knew said he that you who are so incessantly drunk would soon vomit up your owner to a young man who was complaining of the number of people who sought his acquaintance he said do not make such a parade of your vanity having been in a very dirty bath he said i wonder where the people who bathe here clean themselves when all the company was blaming an indifferent harp player he alone praised him and being asked why he did so he said because though he is such as he is he plays the harp and does not steal when saluted a harp player who was always left alone by his hearers with good morning cock and when the man asked him why so he said because you when you sing make every one get up when a young man was one day making a display of himself he having filled the bosom of his robe with lupins began to eat them and when the multitude looked at him he said that he marvelled at their leaving the young man to look at him and when a man who was very superstitious said to him with one blow i will break your head and i he replied with one sneeze will make you tremble when hegesias entreated him to lend him one of his books he said you are a silly fellow hegesias for you will not take painted figs but real ones and yet you overlook the genuine practice of virtue and seek for what is merely written a man once reproached him with his banishment and his answer was you wretched man that is what made me a philosopher and when on another occasion some one said to him the people of sinope condemned you to banishment he replied and i condemned them to remain where they were once he saw a man who had been a victor at the olympic games feeding nemonta sheep and he said to him you have soon come across my friend from the olympic games to nemean when when he was asked why athletes are insensible to pain he said because they are built up of pork and beef he once asked for a statue and being questioned as to his reason for doing so he replied i am practicing disappointment once he was begging of some one for he did this at first out of actual want he said if you have given to any one else give also to me and if you have never given to any one then begin with me on one occasion he was asked by the tyrant what sort of brass was the best for a statue 
and he replied, " That of which the statues of Harmodius and Aristogiton are made." When he was asked how Dionysius treats his friends, he said, " Like bags, those which are full he hangs up, and those which are empty he throws away." A man who was lately married put an inscription on his house, Hercules, Callinicus, the son of Jupiter, lives here, let no evil enter, and so Diogenes wrote in addition, an alliance is made after the war is over. He used to say that covetousness was the metropolis of all evils. Seeing on one occasion a profligate man in an inn eating olives, he said, if you had dined thus, you would not have supped thus. One of his apothegms was that the good men were the images of the gods, another that love was the business of those who had nothing to do. When he was asked what was miserable in life, he answered, an indignant old man, and when the question was put to him, what beast inflicts the worst bite, he said, of wild beasts, the sycophant, and of tame animals, the flatterer. On one occasion, he saw two centres very badly painted. He said, which of the two is the worst? Footnote. There is a pun here. Chiron is the word used for worse. Chiron was also the most celebrated of the centres, the tutor of Achilles. End of footnote. He used to say that a speech, the object of which was solely to please was a honeyed halter. He called the belly the charvides of life. Having heard once that Didymon, the adulterer, had been caught in the fact, he said, he deserves to be hung by his name. Footnote. There is a pun intended here. As Diogenes proposed Didymus, a fate somewhat similar to that of the beaver, Cupiens evedere damno testiclorum, End of footnote. When the question was put to him, why gold is of a pale colour, he said, because it has so many people plotting against it. When he saw a woman in a litter, he said, the cage is not suited to the animal. And seeing a runaway slave sitting on a well, he said, my boy, take care you do not fall in. Another time, he saw a little boy who was a stealer of clothes from the baths, and said, Are you going for the unguents, ep alimation, or for the garments, ep alimation? Seeing some women hanging on olive trees, he said, I wish every tree bore similar fruit. At an another time, he saw a clothes stealer and addressed him thus, What moves thee, say, when sleep has closed the sight, to roam the silent fields in dead of night? Art thou some wretch by hopes of plunder led, through heaps of carnage to despoil the dead? Footnote. This is taken from Homer. Pope's version, 455. End of footnote. When he was asked whether he had any girl or boy to wait on him, he said, No. And his questioner asked further, If then you die, who will bury you? He replied, Whoever wants my house? Seeing a handsome youth sleeping without any protection, he nudged him and said, Wake up. Mixed with the vulgar shall thy fate be found, pierced in the back a vile dishonest wound. Footnote. This is also from Homer. Pope's version, 120. End of footnote. And he addressed a man who was buying delicacies at a great expense. Not long, my son, will you on earth remain, if such your dealings. Footnote. This is a parody on Homer, where the line ends, Ol Agorinis, if such is your language, which Diogenes here changes to, Ol Agorizius, if you buy such things. End of footnote. When Plato was discoursing about his ideas, and using the nouns, Tableness and cupness. I, O oh Plato, interrupted Diogenes, see a table and a cup, but I see no tableness or cupness. Plato made answer, This is natural enough, for you have eyes, 
by which a cup and a table are contemplated but you have not intellect by which tableness and cupness are seen on one occasion he was asked by a certain person what sort of a man o diogenes do you think of socrates and he said a madman another time the question was put to him when a man ought to marry and his reply was young men ought not to marry yet and old men never ought to marry at all when asked what he would take to let a man give him a blow on the head he replied a helmet seeing a youth smartening himself up very carefully he said to him if you are doing that for men you are miserable and if for women you are profligate once he saw a youth blushing and addressed him courage my boy that is the complexion of virtue having once listened to two lawyers he condemned them both saying that the one had stolen the thing in question and the other had not lost it when asked what wine he liked to drink he said that which belongs to another a man said to him one day many people laugh at you but i he replied i am not laughed down when a man said to him that it was a bad thing to live not to live said he but to live badly when some people were advising him to make search for a slave who had run away he said it would be a very absurd thing for manus to be able to live without diogenes but for diogenes not to be able to live without manus when he was dining on olives a cheesecake was brought in on which he threw the olive away saying keep well aloof o stranger from all tyrants footnote this is a line of phinegie of euripides verse 40 end of footnote and presently he had it he drove the olives off must is of the aleph footnote the pun here is on the similarity of the noun elf an olive to the verb elf to drive the words must is of the aleph are of frequent occurrence in homer end of footnote when he was asked what sort of a dog he was he replied when hungry i am a dog of melita when satisfied a molossian a sort which most of those who praise do not like to take out hunting with them because of the labor of keeping up with them and in like manner you cannot associate with me from fear of pain i give you the question was put to him whether wise men ate cheese cakes and he replied they ate everything just as the rest of mankind when asked why people give to beggars and not to philosophers he said because they think it possible that they themselves may become lame and blind but they do not expect ever to turn out philosophers he once begged of a covetous man and as he was slow to give he said man i am asking you for something to maintain me i strophen and not bury me i staffen when someone reproached him for having tampered with coinage he said there was a time when i was such a person as you are now but there never was when you were such as i am now and never will be and to another person who reproached him on the same grounds he said there were times when i did what i did not wish to do but that is not the case now when he went to mindus he saw some very large gates but the city was a small one and so he said ho oh, men of mindus shut your gates lest your city should steal out on one occasion he saw a man who had been detected stealing purple and he said a purple death and mighty fate overtook him footnote this line occurs in homer end of footnote when craterus entreated him to come and visit him he said i would rather lick up salt at athens than enjoy a luxurious table with craterus on one occasion he met anaximenes the orator who was a fat man and thus accosted him pray give us who are poor some of your belly for by doing so you will be relieved yourself and you will assist us and once when he was discussing some point diogenes held up a piece of salt fish 
and drew off the attention of his hearers and as anaximenes was indignant at this he said see one penny worth of salt fish has put an end to the lecture of anaximenes being once reproached for eating in the market-place he made answer i did for it was in the market-place that i was hungry some authors also attribute the following repartee to him plato saw him washing vegetables and so coming up to him he quietly accosted him thus if you had paid court to dionysus you would not have been washing vegetables and he replied with equal quietness if you had washed vegetables you would never have paid court to dionysus when a man said to him most people laugh at you and very likely he replied the asses laugh at them but they do not regard the asses neither do i regard them once he saw a youth studying philosophy and said to him well then inasmuch as you are leading those who admire your person to contemplate the beauty of your mind a certain person was admiring the offerings in the temple of samothras footnote the samothracian gods were gods of the sea and it was customary for those who had been saved from shipwreck to make them an offering of some part of what they had saved and of their hair if they had saved nothing but their lives End of footnote. and he said to him they would have been much more numerous if those who were lost had offered them instead of those who were saved but some attribute this speech to diogorus the thelian once he saw a handsome youth going to a banquet and said to him you will come back worse chiron and when he the next day after the banquet said to him i have left the banquet and was no worse for it he replied you were not chiron but irishion footnote irishion was another of the centaurs who was killed by hercules end of footnote he was begging once of a very ill-tempered man and as he said to him if you can persuade me i will give you something he replied if i could persuade you i would beg you to hang yourself he was on one occasion returning from lacedaemon to athens and when someone asked him whither are you going and whence do you come he said i am going from the men's apartments to the women's another time he was returning from the olympic games and when someone asked him whether there had been great multitude there he said a great multitude but very few men he used to say that debauched men resembled figs growing on a precipice the fruit of which is not tasted by men but devoured by crows and vultures when freen was dedicated a golden statue of venus at delphi he wrote upon it from the profligacy of the greeks once alexander the great came and stood by him and said i am alexander the great king and i said he am diogenes the dog and when he was asked to what actions of his it was owing that he was called a dog he said because i fawn upon those who give me anything and bark at those who give me nothing and bite the rogues on one occasion he was gathering some of the fruit of a fig tree and when the man who was guarding it told him a man hung himself on this tree the other day i then said he will now purify it once he saw a man who had been a conqueror at the olympic games looking very often at a courtesan look said he at that warlike ram who is taken prisoner by the first girl he meets one of his sayings was that good-looking courtesans were like poisoned mead end of chapter two part two read by lambda chapter two part three of the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book six by diogenes laetius translated by 
Charles Duke Young Chapter two Part three Life of Diogenes On one occasion he was eating his dinner in the market place, and the bystanders kept constantly calling out Dog But he said It is you who are the dogs who stand around me while I am at dinner. When two effeminate fellows were getting out of his way, he said, Don't be afraid. A dog does not eat beetroot. Being once asked about a debauched boy as to what country he came from, he said, He is a Tegian. Footnote This is a pun on the similarity of the sound Tegia to Tegios, a brothel. End of footnote seeing an unskilful wrestler professing to heal a man he said what are you about are you in hopes now to overthrow those who formerly conquered you on one occasion he saw the son of a courtesan throwing a stone at a crowd and said to him take care lest you hit your father when a boy showed him a sword that he had received from one to whom he had done some discreditable service he told him the sword is a good sword, but the handle is infamous. And when some people were praising a man who had given him something, he said to him, And do not you praise me, who was worthy to receive it? He was asked by someone to give him back his cloak. But he replied, If you gave it to me, it is mine. And if you only lent it to me, I am using it. A supposititious son, Epovelimios, of somebody once said to him that he had gold in his cloak no doubt said he that is the very reason why i sleep with it under my head epovivilliminos when he was asked what advantage he had derived from philosophy he replied if no other at least this that i am prepared for every kind of fortune the question was put to him what countryman he was and he replied a citizen of the world some men were sacrificing to the gods to prevail on them to send them sons and he said and do you not sacrifice to procure sons of particular character once he was asking the president of a society for a contribution and said to him spoil all the rest but keep your hands from hector he used to say that courtesans were the queens of kings for that they asked them for whatever they chose when the Athenians had voted that Alexander was Bacchus, he said to them, Vote too, that I am Serapis. When a man reproached him from going into unclean places, he said, The sun too penetrates into privies, but is not polluted by them. When supping in a temple, as some dirty loaves were set before him, he took them up and threw them away, saying that nothing dirty ought to come into a temple. And when someone said to him, you philosophize without being possessed of any knowledge. He said, If I only pretend to wisdom, that is philosophizing. A man once brought him a boy and said that he was a very clever child and one of an admirable disposition. What then, said Diogenes, does he want of me? He used to say that those who utter virtuous sentiments but do not do them, are no better than harps for that a harp has no hearing or feeling once he was going into a theatre while everyone else was coming out of it and when asked why he did so it is said he what i have been doing all my life once when he saw a young man putting on effeminate airs he said to him are you not ashamed to have worse plans for yourself than nature had for you for she has made you a man but you are trying to force yourself to be a woman. When he saw an ignorant man tuning a salary, he said to him, Are you not ashamed to be arranging proper sounds on a wooden instrument and not arranging your soul to a proper life? When a man said to him, I am not calculated for philosophy, he said, Why then do you live if you have no desire to live properly? To a man who treated his father with contempt, he said, Are you not ashamed to despise him, to whom you owe it, that you have it in your power to give yourself as at all?
seeing a handsome man chattering in an unseemly manner he said are you not ashamed to draw a sword cut of lead out of a scabbard of ivory being once reproached for drinking in a vantaner's shop he said i have my hair cut too in a barber's at another time he was attacked for being accepted a cloak from antipater but he replied refuse not thou to heed the gifts from which the mighty gods proceed footnote homer sixty five end of footnote a man once struck him with a broom and said take care so he struck him in return with a staff and said take care he once said to a man who was addressing anxious entreaties to a courtesan what can you wish to obtain you wretched man that you had not better be disappointed in seeing a man drinking all over with unguents he said to him have a care lest the fragments of your head give a bad order to your life one of his sayings was that servants serve their masters and that wicked men are the slaves of their appetites being asked why slaves were called andropoda he replied because they have the feet of men tu poda sandro and a soul such as you who are asking this question he once asked a profligate fellow for a mina and when he put the question to him why he asked others for an obol and him for a mina he said because i hope to get something from the others another time but the gods alone know whether i shall extract anything from you again once he was reproached for asking favors while plato never asked for any and he said he asks as well as i do but he does it bending his head that no one else may hear one day he saw an unskilful archer shooting so he went out and sat down by the target saying now i shall be out of the harm's way he used to say that those who were in love were disappointed in regard of the pleasure they expected when he was asked whether death was an evil he replied how can that be an evil which we do not feel when it is present when alexander was once standing by him and saying do not you fear me he replied no for what are you a good or an evil and as he said that he was good who then said diogenes fears the good he used to say that education was for the young sobriety for the old comfort for the poor riches and for the rich an ornament when didymus the adulterer was once trying to cure the eye of a young girl chorus he said take care lest when you are curing the eye of the maiden you do not hurt the pupil footnote there is a pun here kori means both a girl and the pupil of the eye and fitiro to destroy is also especially used for to seduce end of footnote a man once said to him that his friends laid plots against him what then said he are you to do if you must look upon both your friends and enemies in the same light on one occasion he was asked what was the most excellent thing among men and he said freedom of speech he went once into a school and saw many statues of the muses but very few pupils and said gods and all my good schoolmasters you have plenty of pupils he was in the habit of doing everything in public whether in respect of venus or ceres and he used to put his conclusions in this way to people if there is nothing absurd in dining then it is not absurd to dine in the market place but it is not absurd to dine therefore it is not absurd to dine in the market place and as he was continually doing manual work in the public he used to say would that by rubbing my belly i could get rid of hunger other things also attributed to him which it would take long time to enumerate there is such a multiplicity of them he used to say that there are two kinds of exercise that namely of the mind and that of the body and that the latter of these created in the mind such quick and agile fantasies at the time of its performance 
has very much facilitated the practice of virtue but that one was imperfect without the other since the health and vigour necessary for the practice of what is good depend equally on both mind and body and he used to allege as proofs of this and of the ease with which practice imparts to acts of virtue that people could see that in the case of mere common working grades and other employments of that kind the artisans arrived at no inconsiderable accuracy by constant practice and that any one may see how much one flute player or one wrestler is superior to another by his own continued practice and if those men transferred the same training to their minds they would not labour in a profitless or imperfect manner he used to say also that there was nothing whatever in life which could be brought to perfection without practice and that that alone was able to overcome every obstacle that therefore as we ought to repudiate all useless toils and to apply ourselves to useful labours and to live happily we are only unhappy in consequence of most exceeding folly for the very contempt of pleasure if we only inure ourselves to it is very pleasant and just as they who are accustomed to live luxuriously are brought very unwillingly to adopt the contrary system so they who have been originally inured to the opposite system feel a sort of pleasure in the contempt of pleasure this used to be the language which he held and he used to show in practice really altering men's habits and deferring in all things rather to the principles of nature than to those of law saying that he was adopting the same fashion of life as hercules did preferring nothing in the world to liberty and saying that everything belonged to the wise and advancing arguments such as i mentioned just above for instance everything belongs to the gods and the gods are the friends of the wise and all the property of friends is held in common therefore everything belongs to the wise he also argued about the law that without it there is no possibility of a constitution being maintained for without a city there can be nothing orderly but a city is an orderly thing and without a city there can be no law therefore law is order and he played in the same manner with the topics of noble birth and reputation and all other things of that kind saying that they were all veils as it were for wickedness and that that was the only proper constitution which consisted in order another of his doctrines was that all women ought to be possessed in common and he said that marriage was a nullity and that the proper way would be for every man to live with her whom he could persuade to agree with him and on the same principle he said that all people's sons ought to belong to every one in common and there was nothing intolerable in the idea of taking anything out of a temple or eating any animal whatever and that there was no impiety in tasting even human flesh as is plain from the habits of foreign nations and he said that this principle might be correctly extended to every case and every people for he said that in reality everything was a combination of all things for that in bread there was meat and in vegetables there was bread and so there was some particle of all other bodies in everything communicating by invisible passages and evaporating and he explains his theory of us clearly in the thesitis if indeed the tragedies attributed to him are really his composition and not rather the work of philistus of agina his intimate friend or of pasiphone the son of lucian who is stated by favorinus in his universal history to have written them after diogenes's death music and geometry and astronomy and all things of that kind he neglected as useless and unnecessary but he was a man very happy in meeting arguments as his plain form what we have already said and he bore being sold with most magnanimous spirit for he was sailing to agina and was taken prisoner by some pirates under the command of skirpalus he was carried off to crete and sold and when circe asked him for what art he understood he said that of governing men and presently pointing to corinthian very carefully dressed 
the same Zeniades, whom we have mentioned before. He said, Sell me to that man, for he wants a master. Accordingly Zeniades bought him, and carried him away to Corinth, and then he made him tutor of his sons, and committed to him the entire management of his house. And he behaved himself in every affair in such a manner, that Zeniades, when looking over his property, said, A good genius has come into my house. And Cleomenes, in his book, which is called the schoolmaster, says that he wished to ransom all his relations, but that Diogenes told him that they were all fools, for that lions did not become the slaves of those who kept them, but, on the contrary, those who maintained lions were their slaves, for that it was a part of slave to fear, but that wild beasts were formidable to men. And the man had the gift of persuasion in a wonderful degree, so that he could easily overcome any one by his arguments. Accordingly, it is said that an Aegean of the name Onescritus, having two sons, sent to Athens one of them, whose name was Androsthenes, and that he, after having heard Diogenes' lecture, remained there, and that after that he sent the elder Philiscus, who has been already mentioned, and that Philiscus was charmed in the same manner. And last of all, he came himself, and then he too remained, no less than his son, studying philosophy at the feet of Diogenes. So great a charm was there in the discourses of Diogenes. Another pupil of his was Fushion, who was surnamed the Good, the Stipolan, the Megarian, and the great many other men of eminence as statesmen. He is said to have died when he was nearly ninety years of age, but there are different accounts given of his death, for some say for that he ate an ox's foot raw and was in consequence seized by a bilious attack of which he died. Others, of whom Kerkidas, a megapolitan, and Creighton, is one, say that he died of holding his breath for several days, and Kerkidas speaks thus of him in his Meliambics. He, the Sinopian who bore the stick, wore his cloak doubled, and in the open air dined without washing, would not bear with life a moment longer, but he shut his teeth and held his breath, he truly was the son of Jove, and most heavenly-minded dog, the wise Diogenes. Others say that he, while intending to distribute a polypus to his dogs, was bitten by them through the tendon of his foot, and so died. But his own greatest friends, as Antisthenes, tells us in his successions, rather than sanction the story of his having died from holding his breath. For he used to live in the cranium, which was a gymnasium at the gates of Corinth, and his friends came according to their custom, and found him with his head covered, as they did not suppose that he was asleep, for he was not a man much subject to the influence of night or sleep. They drew away his cloak from his face, and found him no longer breathing, and they thought he had done this on purpose, wishing to escape the remaining portion of his life. On this there was a quarrel, as they say, between his friends, as to who should bury him, and they even came to blows. But when the elders and the chief men of the city came there, they say that he was buried by them at the gate, which leads to Isthmus, and they placed over him a pillar, on that a dog of Parian marble, and at a later period his fellow citizens honoured him with the brazen statues, and put this inscription on them, Even brass by lapse of time doth old become, but there is no such time as shall efface your lasting glory wise diogenes since you alone did teach to men the art of a contented life the surest path to glory and a lasting happiness we ourselves have written an epigram on him in the prosilvismatic meter a tell me diogenes tell me true i pray how did you die what fate to pluto bore you b the savage bite of an envious dog did kill me. Some, however, say that he was dying, he ordered his friends to throw his corpse away without burying it, so that every beast might tear it, or else to throw it into a ditch, and sprinkle a little dust over it. And others say that his injunctions were that he should be thrown into Elisuas, 
that so he might be useful to his brethren. But Demetrius, in his treatise on men of the same name, say that Diogenes died in Corinth the same day that Alexander died in Babylon, and he was already an old man, as early as the hundred and thirteenth Olympiad. The following books are attributed to him. The dialogues entitled Kephelion, the Ichthyas, the Jacktaw, the Leopard, the People of Athenians, the Republic, one on moral art, one on wealth, one on love, the Theodorus, the Hypsias, the Aristarchus, one on death, a volume of letters, seven tragedies, the Helen, the Thistus, the Hercules, the Achilles, the Medea, the Chrysippus, and the Oedipus. But Sosicrates, in the first book of his successions, and Satyrus in the fourth book of his lives, both assert that none of all these are the genuine compositions of Diogenes, and Satyrus affirms us that the tragedies are the work of Philiscus, the Agentian, a friend of Diogenes. But Sotian, in his seventh book, says that these are the only genuine works of Diogenes, a dialogue on virtue, another on the good, another on love, the beggar, the Solomaeus, the leopard, the Cassander, the Cephalian, and the Aristocarchus, the Cispheus, the Ganymede, a volume of apothegms, and another of letters, are all work of Philiscus. There were five persons of the name of Diogenes, the first a native of Apollyana, a natural philosopher, and the beginning of his treatise on natural philosophy is as follows. It appears to me to be well for every one who commences any kind of philosophical treatise to lay down some undeniable principle to start with. The second was a Sikimian, who wrote on the account of Peloponnesus. The third was the man of whom we have been speaking. The fourth was a Stoic, a native of Seleucia, but usually called a Babylonian, from the proximity of Seleucia to Babylon. The fifth was a native of Tarsus, who brought on the subject of some questions concerning poetry, which he endeavours to solve. Athenodorus, in the eighth book of his Conversations, says that the philosopher always had a shining appearance from his habit of anointing himself. End of chapter 2 Part 3 Read by Lambda Chapter 3 of The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers Book 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers Book 6 by Diogenes Laetius Translated by Charles Duke Young Chapter 3 Life of Monimus Monimus was a Syracusan and a pupil of Diogenes, but also a slave of some Corinthian money changer. As Sosicrates tells us, Seniades, who bought Diogenes, used often to come to him, extolling the excellency of Diogenes, both in action and words, till he excited a great affection for the man in the mind of Monimus, for he immediately feigned madness and threw about all the money and all the coins that were on the table, until his master discarded him, and then he straightway went to Diogenes and became his pupil. He also followed Crates, the cynic, a good deal, and devoted himself to the same study as he did, and the sight of this conduct of his made his master all the more think him mad. And he was a very eminent man, so that even Menander, the comic poet, speaks of him. Accordingly, in one of his plays, namely in Hippocomus, he mentions him thus, There is a man, O fellow, named Monimus, a wise man, though but little known, and one who bears a wallet at his back, and is not content with one but three. He never spoke a single sentence, by great Joe, I swear, like this one, Know thyself, or any other of the off-quoted proverbs, all such sayings he scorned, and he did beg his way through dirt, 
teaching that all opinion is but vanity but he was a man of such gravity that he despised glory and sought only for truth he wrote some jests mingled with serious treatises and two essays on appetites and an exhortation chapter four life of onesicritus onesicritus is called by some authors an aeginetan but demetrius the magnesian affirms that he was a native of astipalia he also was one of the most eminent of the disciples of diogenes and he appears in some points to resemble xenophon for xenophon joined in the expedition of cyrus and onesicritus in that of alexander and xenophon wrote the creopedia and onesicritus wrote on the account of education of alexander xenophon too wrote a panegyric on cyrus and onesicritus one on alexander they were also both similar to one another in style except that a copyist is naturally inferior to the original menander too who was surnamed rhymus was a pupil of diogenes and a great admirer of homer and so was segesius of sinope who was nicknamed clocus and felsicus the aeginetan as we have said before chapter five life of cratus cratus was a theban by birth and the son of ascondus he also was one of the eminent disciples of the cynic but hippopotus asserts that he was not a pupil of diogenes but bryson the achaean there are the following sportive lines of his quoted the waves surround vain peresus fruitful soil and fertile acres crown the sea-born isle land which no parasite ever dares invade or lewd seducer of a hapless maid it bears figs bread thyme garlic savoury charms gifts which never tempt man to detest arms they would rather fight for gold than glory's dreams there is also an account book of his much spoken of which is drawn up in such terms as these put down the cook for minas half a score put down the doctor for drachma more five talents to the flatterer some smoke to the adviser an obol and a cloak for the philosopher for the willing nymph a talent he was also nicknamed door opener because he used to enter every house and give the inmates advice these lines too are his all this i learned and pondered in my mind drawing deep wisdom from the muses kind but all the rest is vanity there is a line too which tells us that he gained from philosophy a peck of lupins and to care for nobody this too is attributed to him hunger checks love and should it not time does if both should fail you then a halter choose he flourished about the hundred and thirteenth olympiad antisthenes in his successions says that he having once in a certain tragedy seen telephus holding a date basket and in a miserable plight in other respects betook himself to the cynic philosophy and having turned his patrimony into money for he was of illustrious extraction he collected three hundred talents by that means and divided them among the citizens and after that he devoted himself to philosophy with such eagerness that even philemon the comic poet mentions him accordingly he says and in the summer he would a shaggy gown to inure himself to a hardship in the winter he wore mere rags but diocles says that it was diogenes who persuaded him to discard all his estate and his flocks and to throw his money into the sea and he says further that the house of cratus was destroyed by alexander and that of hippocacia under philip but he would very frequently drive away with his staff those of his relations who came after him and endeavoured to dissuade him from his design and he remained immovable demetrius the magnesian relates that he deposited his money with the banker making an agreement with him that if his sons turned out ordinary ignorant people he was then to restore it to them but if they became philosophers 
than he was to divide it among the people for that they were if they were philosophers would have no need of anything and eratosthenes tells us that he had by hipparchia whom we shall mention hereafter a son whose name was pasicles and that when he grew up he took him to a brothel kept by a female slave and told him that was all the marriage that his father designed for him but that marriages which resulted in adultery were themes for tragedians and had exile and bloodshed for their prizes and the marriages of those who lived with courtesans are subjects for the comic poets and often produced madness as the result of debauchery and drunkenness he had also a brother named pasicles a pupil of euclides favorinus in the second book of his commentaries relates a witty saying of his for he says that once when he was begging a favour of the master of a gymnasium on the behalf of some acquaintance he touched his thighs and as he expressed his indignation at this he said why do they not belong to you as well as your knees he used to say that it was impossible to find a man who had never done wrong in the same way as there was always some worthless seed in a pomegranate on one occasion he provoked nicodromus the harp player and received a black eye from him so he put a plaster on his forehead and wrote upon it nicodromus did this he used to abuse prostitutes designedly for the purpose of practising himself in enduring reproaches when demetrius phalerus sent him some loaves and wine he attacked him for his present saying i wish that fountains bore loaves and it is notorious that he was a water drinker he was once reproved by the adelus of athenians for wearing fine linen and he replied i will show you theophrastus also clad in fine linen and as they did not believe him he took them to a barber shop and showed to them as he was being shaved at thebes he was once scorched by the master of the gymnasium though some say it was by eutycrates at corinth and dragged out by the feet but he did not care and quoted the line i feel o mighty chief your matchless might dragged foot first downward from the ethereal height footnote this is a parody on homer pope's version 760 end of footnote but diocles says that it was menedemus of eretria that he was dragged in this manner for that as he was a handsome man and supposed to be very obsequious to asclepiades the philistian crates touched his thighs and said is asclepiades within and menedemus was very much offended and dragged him out as has been already said and then crates quoted the above cited line zeno the city aeon in his apothegms says that he once sewed up a sheep's fleece in his cloak without thinking of it and he was a very ugly man and one who excited laughter when he was taking exercise and he used to say when he put up his hands courage crates as far as your eyes and the rest of your body is concerned for you shall see those who now ridicule you convulsed with disease and envying your happiness and accusing themselves of slothfulness one of his sayings was that a man ought to study philosophy up to the point of looking on generals and donkey drivers in the same light another was that those who live with flatterers are as desolate as calves when in the company of wolves for that neither the one nor the other are with whom they ought to be or their own kindred but only with those who are plotting against them when he felt that he was dying he made verses on himself saying your going noble hunchback your going to pluto's realms bent double by old age for he was humpbacked from age when alexander asked him whether he wished to see the restoration of his country he said what would be the use of it for perhaps some other alexander would come at some future time and destroy it again but poverty and dear obscurity are what a prudent man should think his country for these even fortune can't deprive him of he also said that he was 
a fellow countryman of wise diogenes whom even envy never had attacked menander in his twin sister mentions him thus for you will walk with me wrapped in your cloak as his wife used with Sinicrates. he gave his daughter to his pupils as he himself used to say to have and keep on trial for a month end of chapter 5 read by lambda chapter 6 of the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book 6 by diogenes laertius translated by charles duke young chapter 6 life of metrocles metrocles was the brother of hipparchia and though he had formerly been a pupil of theophrastus he had profited so little by his instructions that once thinking that while listening to a lecture on philosophy he had disgraced himself by his inattention he fell into despondency and shut himself up in his house intending to starve himself to death accordingly when crates heard of it he came to him having been sent for and eating number of lupins on purpose he persuaded him by numbers of arguments that he had done no harm for that it was not to be expected that a man should not indulge his natural inclinations and habits he comforted him by showing him that he in a similar case would certainly have behaved in a similar manner and after that he became a pupil of crates and a man of great eminence as a philosopher he burnt all his writings as secretan tells us in the first book of his apothegms and said these are the phantoms of infernal dreams as if he meant that they were all nonsense but some say it was the notes which he had taken of the lectures of theophrastus which he burnt quoting the following verse vulcan draw near to state is ask your aid footnote homer pope's version 460 end of footnote he used to say that some things could be bought with money as for instance a house and some with time and industry as education that wealth was mischievous if a man did not use it properly he died at a great age having suffocated himself his pupils were theomentus and cleomenus Demetrius of Alexandria, the son of Theombrotus, Timarchus of Alexandria, the son of Cleomenes, and Echecles of Ephesus. Not but what Echecles was also a pupil of Theombrotus, and Menedemus, of whom we shall speak hereafter, was his pupil. Menippus of Sinope too was a very eminent person in his school. Chapter seven, life of Hipparchia. Hipparchia, the sister of Metrocles, was charmed among others by the doctrine of this school. Both she and Metrocles were native of Maronia. She fell in love with both the doctrines and the manners of Crates, and could not be diverted from her regard for him by either the wealth or high birth or personal beauty of any of her suitors. But Crates was everything to her, and she threatened her parents to make away with herself. if she were not given in marriage to him crates accordingly being entreated by her parents to dissuade her from this resolution did all he could and at last as he could not persuade her he rose up and placing all his furnitures before her he said this is the bridegroom whom you are choosing and this is the whole of his property consider these facts for it will not be possible for you to become his partner if you do not also apply yourself to the same studies and conform to the same habits that he does but the girl chose him and assuming the same dress that he wore went about with him as her husband and appeared with him in public everywhere and went to all entertainments in his company and once when she went to sup with lysimachus she attacked theodorus who was surnamed the atheist 
proposing to him the following sophism what theodorus could not be called wrong for doing that same thing hipparchia ought not to be called wrong for doing but theodorus does no wrong when he beats himself therefore hipparchia does no wrong when she beats theodorus he made no reply to what she said but only pulled her clothes about but hipparchia was neither offended nor ashamed as many a woman would have been but when he said to her who is the woman who has left the shuttle so near the warp footnote this line is from bache of euripides verse one thousand two hundred and twenty eight end of footnote i theodorus am that person she replied but do i appear to you to have come to a wrong decision if i devote the time to philosophy which i otherwise should have spent at the loom and these and many other sayings are reported of this female philosopher there is also a volume of letter of cratus extant footnote from this last paragraph it is inferred by some critics that originally the preceding memoirs of cratus metrocles and hipparchia formed only one chapter or book end of footnote in which she philosophizes most excellently and in style is very little inferior to plato he also wrote some tragedies which are imbued with the very sublime spirit of philosophy of which the following lines are a specimen tis not one town nor one poor single house that is my country but in every land each city and each dwelling seems to me a place for my reception ready made and he died at a great age and was buried in boetia chapter eight life of menippus menippus was also a cynic and a phoenician by descent a slave by birth as achaicus tells us in his ethics and diocles informs us that his master was a native of pontus of the name of baton but that subsequently in consequence of his importunities and miserly habits he became rich and obtained the rights of citizenship at corinth he never wrote anything serious but his writings are full of ridiculous matter and in some respects similar to those of meleager who was his contemporary and hermippus tells us that he was a man who lent money at a daily interest and that he was called a usherer for he used to lend on nautical usury and take security so that he amassed a great amount of riches but at last he fell into a snare and lost all his money and in a fit of despair he hung himself and so he died and we have written a playful epigram on him this man was a syrian by birth and a cretan a serious hound as the name he was known by sets forth you have heard of him oft i will be bound his name was menippus men entered his house and stole all his goods without leaving a louse when from this the dog's nature you plainly may tell he hung himself and so went off to hell but some say that the books attributed to him are not really his work but are the composition of dionysus and zopyrus the colophonians who wrote them out of joke and then gave them to him as a man well able to dispose of them there were six persons of the name menippus the first was the man who wrote a history of lydians and made an abridgment of xanthus the second was this man of whom we have been speaking the third was a sophist of stratonis a carian by descent the fourth was a statuary the fifth and sixth were painters and they were both mentioned by apollodorus the writings left by the cynic amount to thirteen volumes a description of the dead a volume called wills a volume of letters in which gods are introduced treatises addressed to natural philosophers and mathematicians and grammarians one on the generation of epicurus and on the observance of the twentieth day by the philosophers of his school and one or two other essays chapter nine the life of menedemus menedemus was a disciple of cleotes of lampsacus he proceeded as hippobotus tells 
to such a great degree of superstition that he assumed the garb of a fury and went about saying that he had come from hell to take notice of all who did wrong in order that he might descend thither again and make his report to the deities who abode in that country and this was his dress a tunic of dark colour reaching to his feet a purple girdle round his waist an arcadian hat on his head with the twelve signs of the zodiac embroidered on it tragic buskins a preposterously long beard and an ashen staff in his hand these then are the lives of each of the cynics and we shall also subjoin some of the doctrines which they all held in common if indeed it was not an abuse of language to call that a sect of philosophy at all instead of as some content it should be termed a mere system of life they wished to abolish the whole system of logic and natural philosophy like aristo of caius and thought that men should study nothing but ethics and what some people assert of socrates was described by diocles as a characteristic of diogenes for he said that his doctrine was that a man ought to investigate only the good and ill that take place within our houses they also discard all liberal studies accordingly antisthenes said that wise men only applied themselves to literature and learning for the sake of perverting others they also wished to abolish geometry and music and everything of that kind accordingly diogenes said once to a person who was showing him a clock it is a very useful thing to save a man from being too late for supper and once when a man made an exhibition of musical skill before him he said cities are governed so are houses too by wisdom not by harp playing and whistling footnote this is a parody on two lines of antiope of eripides kiomi gar andros ivami oiketai polis Ftia cos eistom poliomon iske mega, which may be translated, wisdom it is which regulates both cities and private citizens and makes their lot secure and happy. Nor is her influence of less account in war. End of footnote. Their doctrine is that the chief good of mankind is to live according to virtue, as Antisthenes says in his Hercules in which they resemble the stoics for those two sects have a good deal in common with one another on which account they themselves say that cynicism is a short road to virtue and zeno the city Aeon, lived in the same manner they also teach that men ought to live simply using only plain food in moderate quantities wearing nothing but a cloak and despising riches and glory and nobleness of birth accordingly some of them feed upon nothing beyond herbs and cold water living in any shelter that they can find or in tubs as diogenes did for he used to say that it was a peculiar property of the gods to want nothing and that therefore when a man wished for nothing he was like the gods another of their doctrines is that virtue is a thing which may be thought as antisthenes affirms in his heraclitus and that when it has once been attained it can never be lost they also say that the wise man deserves to be loved and cannot commit error and is a friend to every one who resembles him and that he leaves nothing to fortune and everything which is unconnected with either virtue or vice they call indifferent agreeing in with aristo the cayenne these then were the cynics and now we must pass on to the stoics of which sect the founder was zeno who had been a disciple of crates end of chapter 9 end of the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers book 6 by diogenes laetius translated by charles duke young read by lambda